Amen. So we're studying, uh, once again, chapter 3 tonight. We're gonna, the notes go, uh, through verses 1 through 8. The notes, I made copies of the notes because there's a lot of information here, to be honest with you. Um, and it, and, it, and if you want to, you, you don't have to. That's the good thing about me handing you out the notes. I, I'm paying for it. It doesn't cost you a dime. And if you want to, you can go home and you can study as much as you want. And if you don't want to, you can just stack it on the shelf and, and leave it there, right? So you can do what you want with it. But, that's really the purpose of this Bible study, to be perfectly honest with you, is for us to become hungry, for us to, to try to unlock the treasures of God's communication to us as people. I was looking at Hosea, the, the book of Hosea today, and the prophet, we're all probably familiar with the scripture where it says that my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And the context of that scripture is that Israel was being disobedient. The priests of God who represented God, God's mouthpiece. Remember when we spoke about Messiah, when we took a detour, if you've heard any of those CDs, when we took a detour and we spoke about Messiah, at one portion we spoke about the priest and how the priest and the prophet really were mouthpieces for God. And the truth of the matter is, is that in the book of Hosea, the priests were not communicating God's word. The priests were communicating lies to God's people. And because of that, they had forsaken the law of God, which is the word of God. And so the people were living in a barren land. The people were living separated from understanding, from the knowledge of God. And because of that, they got, found themselves caught up in sin. They found themselves caught up in bondage. They found themselves... Well, what it said was whoring after the false gods of the land. And a very similar concept, I believe, is happening in the church today. That the church has, in some way, shape, or form, left the truth and the purity of God's Word. We've left the purity of God's message. And what we have found, if you flip through enough channels on the TV, and I'm not here to offend anyone, but if it does, it just is what it is. If you flip through enough channels and you watch enough preachers on TV, then what you're going to begin to see is a message that tickles the ears. A message that is is enticing the, the flesh to give more money and give more money. Yes, it requires money for the kingdom of God. I'm not trying to say that, but what I'm trying to get at is, is this. God's people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. And I don't know if you see that or not, but I, what I see in the church is, is that we don't understand the word the way that we should. And I've used this example on many occasions of the Jehovah's Witnesses and how they will study into the late hours of the night. And they will go and they will try to spew their false doctrine in people's homes. And they will work harder at it. And I just don't see where we as Christians seem to be that hungry about God's Word like we should be. And I wanted to preface before we get started by saying this about the knowledge thing. Is that, you know, you don't have to know a whole lot to get saved. You you know what I'm saying? In order to be born again, you don't really have to know a whole lot. What I mean by that is this. You have to come to the conclusion that you're a sinner. Most people know that. Most people, unless they are bound up and steeped in some kind of psychology or humanism, unless they are steeped in some, you know, they're, they're having a problem with, you know, they're an atheist or whatever the case, most people have already come to the conclusion that they're a sinner. So that's not that difficult. So you don't have to know a whole lot. You've got to know that you're a sinner and you've got to believe that Jesus is the answer for your sin. Amen? And you've got to ask Jesus to come into your heart. And you got to ask for forgiveness of your sins. Amen? you got to ask Him to be your Savior. And you got to ask Him that, and let Him know that you want to walk with Him. That's how you get converted. The heart has to be hungry for a change. The heart comes to the realization that He's a sinner and that He needs a Savior. And then the, a supernatural miracle takes place where the heart of man is converted. I can't explain it to you. Jesus is going to talk to Nicodemus about it tonight. But I'm here to tell you what I wanted to say is you don't have to know a whole lot to get saved. But you've got to know some things if you're going to walk with God in victory on this earth today. You've got to understand how God's covenant works. You've got to understand how God works within the confines of His Word. You know what the word covenant means at its base foundation? And we've talked about this in the Bible study before. But you know what? We all need to be on the same page. The concept of the word covenant at its base foundation means an agreement. What I want you to know is is that God has made an agreement with you and I. See, you and I are 
born into sin, and we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. You and I are born into sin. We have an infection called a sinful nature. And that problem has separated us from the holiness of God. And God knew we were in a mess. And He made an agreement. Now that covenant stretches all the way back to the Old Testament. We know that. And He methodically, through the years, thousands of years, has been revealing Himself through the Old Covenant until it was climaxed in Jesus when He died on the cross to usher in really the new covenant. Amen. Jesus brought the new covenant with him. Amen. He was the new covenant. Jesus said, this is my body. It will be broken for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. It will be shed for you. Jesus Christ and him crucified is the new covenant. And so what I'm trying to tell you is, is that within the covenant. Now, you know what? You might walk away from here thinking, man, he said so much. I did everything I could. I wrote the notes down and I'm going to, I'm going to speak the word of God the way that I believe that it's written here. I've studied hard. I've looked into the background. And you know what? At some extent, we got, to, we got to dig in. At some extent, we got to, we got to study. Because if, if, now think about this. If we serve in a, we're walking in here, every last one of us, and we're saying that we believe that there's a supernatural God that exists and that wants to communicate with you and I. So much so that He sent His Son to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Amen? I don't know about you, but I want to know that God. Amen? Alright. And so what I was trying to get across is, and you got to forgive me sometimes because I get on these rabbit trails, but that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And there are people in the church, and I'm one of them, you've heard, many of you have heard my story, walked around in blindness, walked around in bondage as a Christian for 12 years, living in failure and did not know how to get free. Miserable because I didn't want to be that way. And it took brokenness and it took tragedy in my life. And I'm here to tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt, I know that God spoke to me in that place where I was for a reason and the reason was so that other people don't have to get it as bad as what I got it. So that instead, through me and other mouthpieces, amen, vessels, that's all, that's all I am, a broken vessel, amen, that he's putting back together, he can speak the truth of his word, and that if we would hear the truth, see, Jesus said that the, the truth, not a truth, but the truth will make you free. He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. I'm here to tell you there's freedom in Christ. Whether or not you're walking in it tonight is not the issue. There is freedom and liberty in Jesus and what He's accomplished for us at Calvary. And so, if we will hear the truth, now there's still a process that has to, that has to take place. Amen? And, and, we'll, and we'll, you know, we can't preach it all in one night, but let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna, what we're going to do is, we're going to read uh, verses 1 through eight. Amen. And then we're going to go back and we're going to try to pick it apart verse by verse. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. We're in uh, John chapter three and we're going to read verses one through eight. And I'm reading out of the King James version. Okay. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh. And whether it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. We thank you for your word, Lord God, and we just pray that you would speak tonight. So in this first verse, let's just go back and take a look at this. We, the Bible tells us that there was a man named Nicodemus, and that he was a Pharisee, and that he was a ruler of the Jews. 
I thought it was interesting that the name Nicodemus in and of itself means and most most of these things I'm going to tell you tonight are actually written in your notes, but it means that he was victorious amongst his people. All right. When you see now I think it's interesting that we hear the concept that Nicodemus was victorious amongst his people. I don't really want to get ahead of myself, but I want to tell you that there is legitimate evidence within the scriptures, actually within the Gospel of John, that Nicodemus became a follower of Christ, became a disciple of the Lord, and it bears it out in scripture. But right now, that's not how he's coming to Jesus. You see the story. The Bible says that Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews, and the word here is Sanhedrin. It was supposed to be at the bottom of your page, but it got cut off. The Sanhedrin was almost similar to to our Congress today, or our Senate. It was built, uh, made of rulers, religious rulers. The difference between America's Senate, if you will, and the, the Sanhedrin is that the, the nation and the religion of the Jews was actually created by God himself. It was a true theocracy, if you will. It wasn't a democracy. It wasn't whatever the people think. It was what God thinks. And God's leaders and, and rulers were supposed to communicate God's plan to his people. Does that make sense? Okay, we, we, in order for us to properly understand the word, we have to understand the cultural context in which it was spoken. So just bear with me here. So Nicodemus was, a, he was a ruler of the Jews. He was part of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was actually made up of two different groups. I guess you could say kind of like Republicans and Democrats, but a little bit different, right? Because they were supposed to be men of God. All right, they were made up of Pharisees and Sadducees. The interesting thing you'll see in the scriptures if you read about Sadducees is that the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. Okay, the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, and they were really more uh, religious minded or minded the things of God, whereas the Sadducees were more political in how they handled their business. Nicodemus, the Bible tells us, was a ruler of the Jews and he was a Pharisee. There's archaeological evidence of uh, that, you know, excavations that have found that there was actually a man named Nicodemus who was very wealthy and very prominent in the city of Jerusalem during the time frame of Jesus. Now, we don't know from the text whether or not that's who John is actually speaking of in the gospel, but the point is, is that there was a man named Nicodemus. That's that's factual evidence that has been that has been discovered. So this religious leader comes. Now I don't want you to to miss this either, but this religious leader comes to Jesus by night. And if you will turn, you know, the concept here is, is that we don't want to just bypass this because over and over again in the Gospel of John, you've got to pay attention to what the author does, all right? You know, if you go back and you listen to some of the CDs, we've talked about narrative literature. Narrative literature tells a story. The Gospel of John is a narrative. It's telling us a story about a man named Jesus. Amen? And the author, John...